Thank you, everyone, for being uh, here today. Uh, my name is Roberto Requejo. I'm the executive director of uh, Elevated Chicago. We are a coalition of community-based organizations and institutional partners advancing equitable transit-oriented development in the city through investments, through policy change, through storytelling. And I am very honored today, and I have the pleasure of moderating a conversation here with uh, three colleagues that I admire very much in Chicago. Uh, three colleagues that are leading the way of transportation equity policy in Chicago and beyond. Uh, Olatunji Obai Reed is the president and CEO of Equity City. Heidi Persad is the director of transportation for the Center for Neighborhood Technology. And Audrey Wenning is the director of transportation for the Metropolitan Planning Council. You have their bios in the conference materials, and we will get to learn a little bit more about them and their organizations throughout the session. So uh, we have about 50 minutes for the session, and we plan to spend about 30 minutes in conversation with the panel and then open it up to a Q&A uh, session. There are a couple of staff uh, that are going to be circulating with mics, if you can raise your hand so people know who you are and are ready. Thank you. Um, uh, but before we start, I'd like to provide some context on today's topic. Uh, first of all, in the past few years, we have seen a growing role of nonprofit, nonprofits in government-led uh, initiatives in Chicago, both uh, independently and in coalitions. Much of this growth has come from the public sector realizing that nonprofits are better equipped many times and have more trust uh, with communities to tackle issues such as equity or community engagement. And that's going to be the, the main topic of the panel is how do we nonprofits work uh, with government? So parallel to, the, to this growth in the role of nonprofits in public sector partnerships, the public sector uh, has found itself having to find solutions to, fi to four major crises that are affecting not only Chicago, but the United States as a whole. And these four crises can only be solved by doubling down in transportation equity policies. Uh, the four crises converged in 2020, and uh, they are still raging across uh, the country, and they are a racial equity crisis, a public health crisis exemplified by the COVID-19 pandemic, a climate change crisis getting worse and worse, and an unpredictable and volatile economy hurting the working class, low-income families, and BIPOC communities. So to help government solve these massive and converging, converging crises, nonprofits, all of us, have been playing a triple role um, we have become thought partners of government, we have become implementation partners of government, and we have become accountability partners uh, of government. In the case uh, of my organization, Elevated Chicago, for example, we became thought partners with the city of Chicago to create the city's first equitable transit-oriented development policy plan in 2020, and we are now working very closely with the city to get an ETOD ordinance passed by city council, so that was a thought partner function. But we also became impl implementation partners when the city selected 11 ETOD pilots and our coalition provided not only flexible funding for all those bricks and mortar to come to fruition, but also technical assistance uh, to all of them. And finally, we also played an accountability a partnership to the city. We bring together city commissioners uh, several times a year, mayor's office representatives, to um, have a conversation, for them to listen from communities, and for us to keep them also accountable to the promises that they make to our community partners. So these three roles, um, thought partner, implementation partner, accountability partner, are a lot of work. And we work with a lot of agencies. Nonprofits in the Chicago region work with the city of Chicago departments, with suburban municipalities, with the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, with Cook County, with the state of Illinois, and of course, we work also with our transit agencies and with the RTA. And more recently, we have following the USDOT and the FTA announcements for uh, programs and funding for equitable transportation, and we're very excited about those, and we're working together to find ways to ensure that those resources end up in the communities that need them the most and in the organizations that are best positioned to ensure that uh, these resources lead an equitable uh, recovery. 
Um, so this is, again, a lot of work, and we have been able to do all this work thanks to forward-thinking funders and philanthropy. And locally, the Chicago Community Trust, the MacArthur Foundation, Polk Brothers, they have, they have all made key investments in our organizations, and nationally, foundations like Cressy or Robert Good Johnson Foundation or Ford have also been great allies. But while we are fortunate to have these funders on our side, transportation issues are not a priority for the vast majority of foundations, and many of them are still very uncomfortable supporting organizations pushing for policy and for systems change. So, uh, so this is in a nutshell the context for today's conversation. And in this context, some of the questions that we have been uh, dealing with or tackling as a nonprofit community are how should the government compensate nonprofits and community residents for their work? How do we ensure independence, accountability, and prevent co-optation when we partner with governments, let's say, through a contract? Uh, what are the costs and the benefits from uh, working alone versus working in coalition and who absorbs those costs and benefits? Or, for instance, how do we move from making um, immediate changes when you have an opportunity to work with a friendly administration versus making long-term systemic changes that go above and beyond political cycles. So in today's panel, we will explore these and other questions, and we invite the whole audience here to ponder these and others and get ready for the, for the Q&A. And with all that said, here's the first question for our panel. Uh, what is one initiative that your organization has shaped as a thought implementation or accountability partner of government, and what challenges and opportunities have you experienced? And let's start with Obai. Thank you, Roberto. Um, the, the advocacy position that I wanna focus on is probably, it probably falls into the category of thought partner and accountability partner. And that is what we call the equiticity, racial equity scooter prescriptions. So around the time when the first scooter pilot uh, rode out here in Chicago, we recognized some challenges with that rollout and some inherent inequities as a result. So pretty early on in the process, through a coalition of people, we drafted what we call again, racial equity, uh, scooter prescriptions. Very detailed document that describes how to create a scooter system in Chicago that is racially equitable, that reflects a commitment to racial equity and mobility justice. And then we shared that with the city. And while there was some interest, there was no adoption. And then came the second pilot. And we shared those prescriptions again. And again, there was interest and no adoption. So, you know, part of what this means is that for us, we say we are fighting for mere inches of progress. The inequities are so vast. The challenges are so vast. You know, we're not doing this work expecting every advocacy position we take is going to be a win. We, we, we know there's a lot of progress to make. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't mean we're ineffective. It doesn't mean that we're discouraged. We just keep pushing through. So then we come to um, current time, because this, this goes back about three, three years or so. And the city is preparing to, um, to pass a scooter ordinance to establish a permanent scooter program here in, in the city. Um, the process of selecting scooter operators to come into our city. And again, we go to the city and we say, we know this is coming. We want, we want to ensure that what happened with our bike share system is not replicated with our scooter system. Because as here in Chicago, as I'm sure in many cities uh, where you all are coming from, um, bike share rode, and out, rode out in our cities in a completely racially inequitable way. We were ignored. Black and brown neighborhoods were flat out ignored. We did not want to see the same thing happen with scooters. So we go back to the city, we share these racial equity scooter prescriptions. Again, we have a coalition with us. And while most of our recommendations were not um, followed, 
One was adopted, from what I understand, and that was one that uh, now measures ridership as a metric for the scooter operators to hit and not limit it to the geographic deployment of scooters. So a small win. Thank you for sharing. Um, Audrey. Yeah, hi. I will uh, talk about our Toward Universal Mobility plan, which was mentioned in the introduction. So the Metropolitan Planning Council is, as noted, a nonprofit urban planning uh, and policy independent organization, and we work at the regional level, uh, the same geography as our, as our MPO. And we took on uh, looking at mobility through a lens of making sure it works for everyone of all ages and abilities. And we developed a plan that looked at everything from paratransit to making transit accessible for people with people with disabilities to how Lyft and Uber fit into the picture to how uh, people access information. And we found that there were a number of changes that needed to occur in our system. I think we, we all know that uh, you know, if you can't drive, it's very hard to get around. If you have a disability and need special services, it's very tedious and tiresome. Um, so we published this plan with 32 recommendations. And uh, we actually, this is, this is a, a very heartwarming story actually for planning um, in that uh, we've actually been able to implement uh, a number of the recommendations, uh, sometimes uh, in partnership with government agencies or sometimes through legislation. So um, one example has been the fact that, as we all know, our system is so set up for, for car dominance and at the state level, there was a policy with our Illinois Department of Transportation that if they were building out a corridor, uh, if they built sidewalks, the local municipality had to pay 20% of the cost of sidewalks. The DOT would pay 100% of the road, um, but require a local match. And um, so we actually, in coalition with other advocates, uh, developed legislation and that was passed last year. So now every, um, every quarter uh, that builds out a multi-use path or uh, sidewalks, um, that's 100% paid for uh, by the DOT. And that we are hearing from local municipalities that that's a real, a real game changer. And then the second piece I'll mention uh, is that another one of the strategies uh, was to look at, and this was a project done in partnership with the Great Lakes ADA Center, um, Yo Yochai Eisenberg may be in the room, and he was a great partner on this, which was looking at ADA transition planning. So you may know that when ADA was passed 31 years ago, there was a requirement that every municipality of a certain size uh, develop an ADA transition plan to make sure all its uh, right-of-way sidewalks, crosswalks are ADA accessible. and. Um, we took a look following uh, the model that Yohai did nationally at how many communities in our region had ADA transition plans and found that only 11% have, uh, have this and it's a federal requirement and there's no enforcement. Uh, so we, um, you know, we publicized the results of this and we're very, very heartened to see that our Federal Highway Administration regional rep perk up his ears, um, our DOT perked up its ears, and our, most importantly, our MPO um, really got engaged in this, and we're incredibly uh, excited that they are standing up a department of multiple new hires to lead on developing ADA transition plans and providing technical assistance throughout the entire region. They are committing $10 million over multiple years uh, to investing in making sure that every municipality has an ADA transition plan, which will greatly influence, I think, our entire pedestrian realm, as well as making, uh, making the environment uh, more accessible for people with disabilities and as they age. Um, so that's been, that doesn't always happen in planning. So that's just been a great partnership and we really are excited to see um, how, how we move forward from here. Thank you, uh, Audrey, and thank you, Obai. And uh, as you can see, there's already a theme here of intersectionality. Uh, we're talking race, we're talking ability, we're talking, in a way, gender in some cases, um, socioeconomics, and also multimodal. 
uh, and this is just to highlight the amount of work that nonprofits have to deal with and the amount of lenses we have to, to bring to the table. Uh, Center uh, for Neighborhood Technology has also been a leader in the space of equity and community engagement. Heidi, do you have an example that you would like to share with the audience? Hello, good morning everybody. Before I jump into the example, I do wanna just give a brief history on the Transportation Equity Network. Um, so a little bit over two years ago, Center for Neighborhood Technology partnered with multiple community-based organizations, primarily based in the south and west sides of Chicago, to advocate for mobility justice and racial equity in several transportation plans and projects. Um, I would say that we started with a little bit more than 20 organizations some that are up here, Equiticity, uh, Elevated, MPC as some of our larger civic institutions. Um, but two of our partners I noticed are out here in the audience, so I'm just gonna give a shout out to Access Living with Laura Saltzman and Far South Community Development Corporation with Katani Raby. If there's anyone else here from 10, let me know. Um, so what we started doing immediately um, was working with the Chicago Department of Transportation to develop their strategic plan. Um, and we worked closely with, I'll give another shout out here, Assistant Commissioner Jamie Simone from CDOT um, to, put, to, to be involved in several stages of the process of that plan. Um, so what we did was really I think the first time that you saw a collaborative like the Transportation Equity Network be so involved in a strategic plan and provide input um, that really elevated equity um, in that plan. If you take a look at the plan, which was adopted over a year and a half, I mean, it's um, screaming equity <laughs> from, the, from the cover all the way to the implementation steps. And that all had to do with the partnership and the relationships that were built throughout the process of involving the 10 organizations with CDOT in, in the planning process. Um, I think the, the big takeaway here that you know we're talking about accountability, we're talking about all these different things, um, is that when the process began, this question was asked about how many of the community-based organizations here have worked with CDOT before? And the answer was very few, and those that had didn't have a very deep and meaningful experience. So aside from this just being sort of a transactional relationship where organizations were just coming to the table to to give feedback and call it a day. Um, I say that this became much more powerful because there were relationships being built with the Department of Transportation that weren't there before, but also we were building transportation knowledge and capacity in a lot of these community-based organizations, which side note, were not transportation or planning experts. Um, they primarily serve uh, their communities through health and housing, workforce development, social services, et cetera but this space of transportation was really new, and so this process was not just sort of your traditional outreach process where you ask, hey, what should we prioritize, and we're done with it, but really building capacity and making sure that these organizations were involved in the process and can then hold CDOT and others accountable for the implementation of the plan. I think that's all. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you for uh, moving us to the next question uh, also, because we wanted to feature today not only how nonprofits work uh, independently uh, with a government, but also how we work together in coalitions, in collaboratives, as Heidi was, uh, was discussing. I know all of us um, uh, work more and more as a collaborative, and I want to hear some examples also from, from all of you. Maybe, Obai, you want to share some of that work that you do in collaboration? Sure. Um, every, everything we do is in collaboration. We, we rarely do anything by ourselves. One example I'll, I'll point to, and I, I'm gonna, first I should say that um, this again represents thought partnership and um, what was that third category? Accountability, Accountability yes. Uh, we refuse to be an implementation partner on this one. So quick history lesson. Um, I co-founded Slow Road Chicago in 2014. We did community bicycle rides in mostly black and brown, low to moderate income neighborhoods on the south and west side. Early in the process, uh, young people, black and brown young people were telling me they felt they didn't like biking because they felt targeted by the police. This is in 2014, 2015. Um, I went to mainstream white bike, bike advocates. I went to uh, CDOT, the DOT, expressed these concerns, and all of them told me, well, that's likely not true, By Chicago police wouldn't do anything like that. I think a couple of years later, 
I'm glad we got laughs on that one. A couple of years later, the Chicago Tribune released its first report finding biking while black. Black people were being targeted for riding bikes on the sidewalk in ways that white people were not. They ran that report three years in a row, showing inequities every year. Then comes um, about 2017, the video of Laquan McDonald being murdered, a r racial justice reckoning happening both in Chicago and across the world. Um, the US DOJ coming in and investigating Chicago Police Department finding rampant civil rights abuses. Newspapers of record here in Chicago and out across the country coming in and doing their own investigation finding rampant abuse, uh, racism, and corruption. And then the city of Chicago announces its Vision Zero Action Plan. And that plan is leading with an enforcement strategy on the heels of that reality. The city is coming to us and saying, we've done the analysis, black and brown neighborhoods are the most impacted by traffic violence, and your solution is increased police enforcement. In coalition, we push back. We push back, we did it in writing, we did it with social media, we did it with bringing more people to the table, we did it in, in person, showing up in places that Vision Zero was at. Um, we met with the mayor's office, uh, you know, at that point, uh, a deputy mayor, I'm in the mayor's office, some pretty senior people over there. Um, and again, we are fighting for mere inches of progress. None of the recommendations, and again, it was in writing. We framed up our position on um, why it's important to remove police enforcement from Vision Zero, invest equitably in engineering, invest equitably in education, and, uh, and, and, and treat this as a, a, a vehicle to re reduce tra traffic violence using racial equity and mobility justice as the foundations. Um, despite all of that, the city did not adopt our recommendations. And here we are four, five years later, Vision, Vision Zero is still here in our city, and as far as we could tell, uh, police enforcement is still an important part of um, Vision Zero. Here's the other thing that we should understand, though. The city of Chicago, and I, I see some colleagues here, um, the region is years behind other cities and other regions. We are, we are in a time now where there are cities that are actively looking to remove police from traffic safety. And we're still trying to convince the city that police enforcement should not be a part of Vision Zero. We are, we are in a time now where some cities are exploring completely dismantling police departments. And we can't get our city to see there's other ways to reduce traffic violence without the harms of a police enforcement strategy. So again, we are, um, we are still fighting for mere inches of progress. Thank you, uh, Obay. Thank you for the honesty in assessing uh, the situation uh, in Chicago. I think many of us feel that, that sense sometimes that we are a little behind or behind in general, not only when you look at the U.S., but when you look at um, the world in general and how other global cities. Uh, have you found in your work uh, with uh, in this difficult space and as you try to move those inches of progress, any um, areas of hope or either people or systems that you think that's where we should all kind of push for and elevate and support so they can help us from, from inside? Yeah, I, I, do, I do have hope. I, I wouldn't do the work without it. I, I feel confident that um, we will achieve freedom. Um, I am not of the position that structural racism and racialized inequities are inevitable in our society. Slavery wasn't ine inevitable. Colonialism wasn't inevitable. Jim Crow was not an inevitable. And our system of uh, racialized, extractive capitalism is not inevitable, nor is structural racism. So I got hope. Um, so some of the things that give me hope, uh, the city of Philadelphia, the city of Pittsburgh, both remove uh, police from low-level traffic stops. Um, I'm inspired by more and more people expressing a sincere, authentic commitment to racial equity and mobility justice. Um, there's a lot that I like about the new administration here in Chicago. It's years ahead of our previous administration. Well, I certainly uh, wanna push them to do more and more quicker and faster. Um, uh, their commitment to racial equity is much stronger than our previous administration. So all of that together 
um, and the coalitions that we're building um, here in Chicago and some new work that we're starting on racially equitable traffic safety gives me some hope that we will get there. Thank you, Lai. Um, <clears throat> Audrey, what's your assessment and how has MPC worked in um, collaboration with others? Yeah, I, I would say it's um, it's been a really exciting time in Chicago during the pandemic in terms of coalition work getting super strong. Um, I think the, there's a, this is a big city, there are a lot of advocacy organizations and we knew each other and had relationships, but I think during the pandemic when transit was in crisis, uh, we really pulled together and um, we formed some new uh, structures. Uh, one which we're calling CHAT, Chicago Advocates for Transit. We have about a dozen advocacy organizations that um, meet virtually every single week. And we talk about what's going on in the environment. We share information and we develop strategies together. We do things like um, we, we met with um, Representative Chuy Garcia's transportation representative last week. And we're strategizing with him about how to influence the federal, um, federal spending uh, in, a, in a direction for, for equity and sustainability. Uh, we. Uh, we meet, um, there's another group called the Illinois Environmental Council, which uh, is a coalition statewide that has all kinds of different environmental groups. Uh, and they had a little bit of interest in transportation, but it was mostly electric vehicles. And that's, I think many of us know that that's been uh, the thrust of the environmental community largely for a long time. And um, we've been very, very pleased that that group has started a, a spinoff group uh, that's focused entirely on transportation, we meet every two weeks, um, we share information, and we're talking a lot about mode shift and trying to influence um, VMT reduction and working together on, um, you know, we, we've really taken the strategy in the past couple of years of coalitions coming together, one, co one person takes the lead in writing a, letter, a comment letter on something. Um, one example recently was with our regional transportation authority um, that oversees our transit agencies, CTA, PACE, and METRA. They're developing a strategic plan. Um, Roberto was really a catalyst for this. We all came together and we were uh, really wanted to influence the way that strategic plan is um, being managed and approached. And we wrote a, a, a let's see, a sternly worded letter uh, to them, and everybody signed on. Now, we, you know, we have a we have at least probably a dozen agencies signing on now to these letters. Uh, gets the attention of the public agencies, and then we're able to um, meet with them individually. And we had private meetings with them to help shape how they did their engagement on the regional. Uh, strategic plan, which is ongoing now, and I think it's a lot. The process is a lot better than if we if we hadn't done that. Um, so I, I, I'm I'm just really enjoying the collaboration that um, with all the people on the stage and um, their organizations, and we're finding that working together uh, is really powerful and um, is is you know we're able to get. Communic communication with the public agencies and uh, really have meaningful dialogue and and affect change when we're all on the same page and we're sharing information. So I think it's been really exciting seeing how that's strengthened in the past couple of years and I think we'll only get stronger. Thank you. And uh, Heidi, you are at the center of 10, which is a, a massive network of allies uh, looking for a more, a more equitable transportation system in the Chicago region. What are some of your um, challenges that you have experienced and also some areas of hope and opportunity? How do you follow Obai and Audrey? You don't, you just keep elevating them because they're awesome. Um, and so I do wanna just back up a little bit and you were asking about collaboration and I didn't really talk about the collaboration within 10 before I get into external collaborations. Um, but within 10, I said in the beginning, we started with about 20 organizations primarily based in the south and west sides of Chicago. Currently, we're closer to 50, and we're representing the whole city of Chicago as well as suburbs throughout the Chicago metropolitan region, the seven county region that MPC and CMAP cover. Um, and aside from working with CDOT, in the last two years, there has been no shortage of work. We have also worked with the Cook County Department of Transportation and Highways on their bike and transit plans. Hello, Bennett. Um, we've worked with the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning on their COVID mobility recovery plan. We're going to work with the Regional Transportation Authority on their strategic plan. And 
Aside from that, I mean, there's a lot of several advocacy projects that are ongoing as well. Um, so all of this internal collaboration is what I think is helping our network grow. It's the fact that there is um, authenticity to the group. Um, there's strong relationships that are being built through transparency, um, group decision making, um, and then just, uh, I would say, efforts that everyone is kind of getting on board with. Um, and, and we're able to sort of advocate with one another. Um, and with that said, Obai is one of our three co-chairs. Audrey is one of the co-chairs of our um, capacity building committee. And Roberto, also very involved, so elevated. You're not out of this conversation. Um, and so it's, it's been just amazing to see not just the interest in um, agencies wanting to work with 10 in the Chicago region, but also national interest in beginning um, other other networks that will kind of replicate what 10 is doing. Um, so hopefully we'll see more of this uh, growing even outside of the Chicago region in the years to come. Um, but I did mention some of the other agencies that we've been working with in collaboration with. And some of those same um, factors that I mentioned that we're seeing internally are really what we need to see externally to, to have stronger relationships and to have these, these uh, projects work. Um, transparency and communication, I cannot emphasize how important um, those two things are when working with community-based organization, particularly those representing communities where there have been a lot of past harm, um, where there maybe are some iffy relationships with government entities. Um, so when we are trying to sort of engage into new processes, I always have to say if you're not communicating regularly, if you're not just being honest and explaining things well, I mean, this is only gonna go downhill. So let's go back and start again if it didn't happen the first time around. Um, and so really I say that's, that's probably the biggest role that I like to play is just ensuring that the, that the outreach is inclusive, that it's comprehensive, that it includes elements of education, um, and that also there is fair compensation. That has to do a lot with um, when we're talking about respect um, with all of these collaborations. And so yes, we do compensate our community-based organizations for their involvement in all of these planning processes. Um, the same way you would pay a consultant for an hour, an hour and a half of their time, you wanna pay these CBOs. They are running nonprofits that are, maybe don't have the capacity to be involved in these projects, maybe don't have the overhead funding to allow them to take time away from their regular work. So in giving them a stipend, you're allowing them to be able to participate more fully in your projects. So we are always gonna um, ask for compensation, um, sometimes we'll do things for free if people are interested, of course. Um, but I, I can't stress enough how, um, how important it is to, to be fair and to show respect for them, providing the input that is not just going to be useful for um, trying to achieve equity within a plan or project, but is also gonna be sustainable. Community-based organizations are long-standing institutions in their communities. They outlast elected officials. They outlast maybe individual residents. So when you work with a community-based organization on different transportation projects, which we know can take years, and you need to keep coming back to them, they become a real key partner. Thank you, and I cannot stress enough how important uh, this issue of compensation is for, for all of us. I know one of my first conversations back in the day with Obai was about this. He was pointing out publicly how uh, nonprofits, especially those led by people of color, are being extracted uh, resources from without any compensation. We have set up some basic parameters uh, in Elevated and with all of you in some conversations, but especially for those of you in um, private corporations and those of you who have budgets, uh, please do not forget to compensate your nonprofits when you engage them in conversations, in work, in advisory councils, et cetera, et cetera. And with, with that said, yes, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, and uh, you know, uh, I always look at you all as superheroes and I know you have all kinds of superpowers. So the last question before we go to the, to the audience is, imagine you have a superpower to take over the transportation agencies you work with for one day and change one thing, what would you change and why? And let's start with Audrey. I would change, and this would have to be for longer than one day, um, I would flip the road orientation with the bike, pet, and transit orientation. And I would, uh, you know, so many, so many public agencies, you have 
just one or two people focusing on bicycle and pedestrian and safety. Um, and we need to have the majority of our transportation uh, planners leading with bicycle, pedestrian, transit, and safety. Uh, it, we all know it. You know, we don't need to widen roads anymore. Uh, we probably never did. Uh, <laughs> we should have stopped that a long time ago. Uh, and so we, we need to change the focus uh, of our staff and um, just, yeah, lead, lead with, with non-motorized and transit. Um, I'll, I'll just give an example of a project that we're doing with the Metropolitan Planning Council in partnership with the Active Transportation Alliance and our Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus, is, uh, which is a represent, representatives of all the mayors of all 284 municipalities in our region, is focused on bicycle and pedestrian planning this year. We're doing a series of five um, regional events, and we're talking to all the councils of governments, we're, talk we're talking to leaders about the connection between climate action and elevating bicycle and pedestrian planning. And as we've all experienced, I'm sure, in our careers, people, people saying, oh, I, we, you know, we, we don't have money for that. And, and just trying to communicate that there's a ton of money in transportation, you're just spending it, the wrong, you're prioritizing the wrong things. And so um, really getting the, uh, flipping the entire script um, is, is really important. And um, yeah, spending your money first on bike, ped, and safety, and transit supportive uses, and having the people uh, that know how to do that and that are passionate about that um, being dominant is what I would like to see in our transportation agencies. Thank you, Audrey. Putting uh, people before cars, basically. Um, Heidi, how would you spend your day of superpowers within government? Yeah, same as Audrey, more than a day, but um, let's pretend 24 hours. Um, I, I think especially for me, whenever someone approaches CNT and says, you know, we want to work with 10 because we want to make sure that we're addressing equity in this plan or in this project and we want to make sure it's sort of a priority. What always comes to the top of mind for me is, well, then you need to make sure that you have an inclusive outreach process ready to go. Um, how can you really talk about equity without doing equitable work, which means you need to do outreach, you need to listen, you need to go out and talk to community members and truly understand what it is that they are asking for and involve them throughout the entire process. That is how you achieve equity practically. And it seems like a simple answer for some reason. It's not easy <laughs> in translation uh, sometimes. But um, I think that is where your answer lies. And so I would go into every transit agency and I would make sure they had robust outreach efforts. And I do want to um, applaud anyone here um, who has been doing outreach work over the last few years. We are usually understaffed and um, don't get the amount of funding that all the other departments get, um, but are really doing the work that needs to be there to support and keep projects moving. Thank you, Heidi. And Hawaii, what will you do with your superpower? I, I, I told Roberto I wasn't gonna cheat, because you know how something magically appears and says, I'll give you three wishes, only three though. And the first thing we say is, I wish for 100 additional wishes. <laughs> I'm gonna try not to cheat on this one. Um, what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna share is premised by two things. One is that one of the structural barriers that's contributing to racialized inequities in our society is the, um, the agency ownership of the transportation planning process. That's one premise. The other premise is that the experts on both the problems and solutions in black and brown neighborhoods are black and brown people who live and work in our neighborhoods every day. Not white people at the MPO or the DOT or consulting firms. It's black and brown people who are in our neighborhoods. All right, with, that, with those two premises, my superpower is transferring and activating the community ownership of the transportation planning process. Now, I know that scares some of y'all. I can see it. I see y'all shaking in your boots right now. What do you mean the community owns the transportation process? Yeah, I'm, that's, that's what I'm advocating for. It does not mean the DOT and the MPO get completely boxed out. That's not what we're advocating for. The, the, you all as professionals bring something to the table. You bring resources, financial, 
resources, you bring technical expertise, and you bring parameters. You know, we can't do everything we make dream up. We can't run a bike lane up on a sidewalk and through a park and, a, and around some houses. So you all bring those parameters. Those are critical. However, what the, the essence of what we're saying is who should be driving the planning process? Who should be driving the visioning process? Should it be white people at a DLT downtown who rarely come in our neighborhoods, don't understand our needs, don't understand our problems, don't understand at a real deep level what, what the challenges and the problems are that we face? Or should it be black and brown people, community-based organizations that are in our neighborhoods every single day doing this work? Our position is, th is that it's the latter. I feel more confident that when the latter is executed against the impact, the uh, improved life outcomes will be more uh, vibrant than when it's a DOT MPO driving that work. Thank you, Abai. Thank you. And um, what I love about this powerful um, finish of the panel conversation is that you're using your superpower to share power, which is how we all should use our power out there in the transit space. So uh, with that said, we have now an opportunity to uh, ask questions. To I, I mean, I guess, I think you asked, and Yohai is the, our, was our partner on Universal Mobility, so thank you for your partnership. Um, I mean, the, what we're engaged in right now is trying to uh, partner with our public agencies and help shape the applications, uh, you know, in, in increase coordination within our region to make sure that we are applying for the right projects uh, that will be successful and that are going to deliver some of the outcomes we want. I think um, in terms of evaluation, um, I mean, I think what we're, the outcomes we're we want are things that are going to mode shift, that are going to elevate uh, transit, biking, walking, make that more attractive uh, and increase that those modes uh, compared to the car that will, that will manage VMT um, and that will improve safety. And so I think we're, I, I think advocates are look and, and improve equity, you know, improve all of those things for uh, in equity uh, oriented communities. So I think we're trying to look at all of that through that lens. Um, it is it is really complicated. It's rapid fire right now with these notices of funding opportunity. Um, so we're trying to uh, support and uh, and guide and be in conversation with our public agencies. Uh, hopefully have you know, good projects where there's consensus that, uh, that get applied for. But it's, it's hard, a lot, a lot going on right now. Thank you. Uh, Heidi, do you want to add anything? I mean, I'll just quickly add, um, over at CNT, we're just advocating for the ability for federal funds to go directly to nonprofits. Currently, the way we're set up is that whenever we're working on these large scale projects, CNT receives the funding because we have the capacity to do so and then kind of pass through funding in a stipend mode to the organizations that we work with. That may not be the most sustainable form of payment moving forward. And so we think that the more fair option would be for the organizations to be paid directly. Um, by the federal government, but that's not in place yet. So hopefully with um, the infrastructure bill with their involvement, that will be the case. Um, and hi, Ellen from Shared Use Mobility Center, also part 10, just gotta say that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll be brief here. Uh, two things come to mind. One is that short of agencies transferring ownership of the planning process to community-based organizations, they should be working in full partnership with community-based organizations. They should not be doing anything by themselves. And the US DOT should require it. They shouldn't let cities and MPOs and DOTs submit applications without community-based organizations as a part of the application. That should be required. And the second thing is, I, I'm glad you mentioned the point about data. Um, there's no commitment to racial equity without a full quantitative and qualitative analyses to better understand the problem, the severity of the problem, and where the, where the resources should be distributed to improve racialized 
life outcomes. So that analysis, both on the front end and on the back end, are critical. One, on the front end to understand, again, where the challenges are. And two, did the work have an impact? Should it not have had an impact, then we, we got to change up. We got to do something different. That data analysis is critical. Thank you. And I'll just um, add to that that uh, the new administration does have, seems to have a, an interest in, in reaching out to community groups and to um, sending money in the direction of the places that need it the most. They release an equity plan the first time that a federal agency uh, release one, but still, I want to stress, as our panelists mentioned before, that the transportation field across Chicago has been very poorly funded throughout the years, and the capacity has not been provided to community-based organizations, so now you're throwing all these billions out there, expecting that those communities will be ready, and you cannot do that. You have to create that space in the middle to help bridge those resources and put it in the hands of the people who know best, as Obai was pointing out, what the solutions are. So, uh, with that, I think we had another question I mean, yeah, there's, there's really three ways that at least we're doing the work currently. Um, one is we're applying to foundations um, for grants to be able to compensate our community-based organizations to be involved in different processes. So, for example, with the CDOT strategic plan, we received energy foundation funding to allow uh, for compensation in that case. Um, at times, we do have the government entity providing um, the funding directly to CNT and then us passing it through. So in the case of Cook County or CMAP, well, no, sorry. Yes, in the case of Cook County. With CMAP, it's a little bit of a different process here. Um, CNT serves as a subcontractor to prime contractors. And then within the scope of services we have that will pass through funding to the CBOs inside of 10. Um, so those are the three formats in which we're currently functioning. Um, they're working for now, but uh, again, I don't know that that's necessarily the best model for everyone else or to continue um, this format moving forward either, especially as we continue to grow. Just one, one thing I'll mention is um, one of the most grievous inequities that I, I see in Chicago and cities across the country is white-owned engineering and consulting firms being hired by the city to do outreach in black and brown neighborhoods. Why, we, 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 gotta, we gotta convince the city that, that that's the wrong approach. And the, the mechanisms for nonprofits and smaller black and brown led or, uh, consulting firms to get through the paperwork and all of the certifications and all of that, it, it is challenging. I've been trying to do it for four or five years and I still haven't nailed it. So we got to create some, some, some practical policies and mechanisms so that black community-based organizations and black and brown smaller firms are able to get through and get hired by cities to do this work. Absolutely, and I want to give some credit to some of the pioneering agencies in, in Chicago like um, CMAP, RTA, that ha they have found ways, creative ways, but it shouldn't be this exceptional thing that takes forever. Uh, and you all have to remember, a lot of our partners here, they are spending their time advocating for their communities, and often they forget to advocate for themselves. So when the legislations come out, you know, they are trying to get the dollars out there to communities, but they haven't lobbied like those engineering firms do to get avenues into those, um, those, uh, those funds. So thank you for posing that, that question, and that could be in itself also another panel as to how do we compensate. Uh, one final question. I mean, I think I'll say our organization definitely um, is of the mindset that we, we try to support piloting innovative things, but then we 
want them to spin off and be successful and, and then we, we cease to be involved. Uh, so I think it's a case of being able to measure uh, when you're doing a pilot, being able to measure and, and demonstrate the, the outcomes are, are what you want and then um, bringing along the public agencies that you might want to work with long term um, to make sure that you're communicating about what you're doing and you'll have the support of the public agencies uh, is, is, is a lot of it. Make sure that the, the policies are, in the public agencies are looking at, as uh, Commissioner Biagi was saying, they're looking at the policy outcomes. They're, they're, not, they're trying not to be distracted by the technology and, and trying to uh, make sure that whatever the technology is, it's delivering on the policy outcomes. And so I think um, making sure that as any new technologies are being tested or pilots are happening, um, that you can demonstrate that you're delivering on what the city needs as, as outcomes. That that's, that's really critical. And then um, there'll be more support for scaling. There's, there's two examples I'm, I'm able to point to in our work around implementation. One is the Go Hub, and then one is our uh, interest in establishing a um, automated vehicle uh, shuttle uh, demonstration project. For the Go Hub, it's a community mobility center uh, located in North Lawndale on the west side of Chicago. It's under development right now. We, we started that work because we didn't have much faith in the traditional mobility hub model. Uh, meeting the needs of black and brown people living in a low to moderate income neighborhood with severe transportation inequities. So we took it upon ourselves to imagine what a mobility hub looks like when it's neighborhood focused and the, and, and the neighborhood is, is North Lawndale. So we, we designed it up, we framed it up, we wrote it up, we took responsibility for fundraising and going and creating partnerships with community-based organizations and operators and government stakeholders. We, we did all of that work on ourselves because we were more confident that we could build a mobility hub that would meet the needs of people in our neighborhoods than the traditional model, one led by operators or one led by a DOT or an MPO. So we, 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 felt, we, we felt compelled to do that work. We, um, we've made a tremendous amount of progress with partners like MPC and CNT, who are uh, our funded citywide partners on, on that work. Um, our, our developer partner re recently closed on the property. Um, we are having conversations with, with government partners, and there's some interest in helping bring this, this vision to life. So that's, that's one example. And then another example is our work on um, establishing an automated vehicle shuttle demonstration project. Um, there's risk with these technologies. There's risk that these technologies could show up in our neighborhoods or in our cities and do more harm than good. So what should be in place to minimize the risk and maximize the benefits? It goes back to my point earlier, the ownership should rest with us. We should be the ones delivering these technologies into our neighborhoods. Now, I'm, I'm not a tech person. Um, I'm not an expert on AV. However, I feel like I could bring a team together and we could figure it out and we could work with some AV providers and, and do a shuttle, a demonstration project that is specifically focused on improving life outcomes. We're not bringing these, we don't want to bring these technologies to our neighborhoods just for the heck of it. We want our lives to improve as a result of the technologies showing up in our neighborhoods. And I'm more confident, again, that when we're delivering the technology, it'll be more impactful. Thank you. Heidi, do you want to add anything? So um, I wanted to thank the three of you for your honesty today, for your patience working with government, with your for your hope to, to do this, and I wanted to ask everyone for a round of applause to our excellent panel um, today. Thank you.